When we finished our first video on the history of the canon, we had made it up to Jerome for the first 500 years of the history of the canon. Now I have to cover 1500 years from then till now. The challenge is on. If you missed the first video, I'll have a link to it up here or right under here or at the very end of this video so that you can catch up on that. But by way of summary, here are the major developments that I covered in the first video. First, when the Christian community separated from the Jewish community, they adopted the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Since the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, contained more books than the 39 books in the Hebrew Bible, the church ended up with a very long and slow debate about the status of what are often referred to as the apocryphal books. We'll see how this plays a major role in the debates concerning the canon during the Reformation. Second, in 313 AD, the church became an official religion in the Roman Empire with Constantine's edict. This meant that the church could now produce much higher quality and more Bibles. In fact, Constantine even commissioned Eusebius, who was a bishop over in modern day Lebanon, to produce 50 high quality Bibles for the empire. Third, church councils played a role in defining the canon. For example, at the councils of Carthage in 397 and then 419 AD, they listed the 66 books that are often included in the Protestant Bibles. At the Council of Rome, a little bit later, they're going to include all the books that the Catholics include in their Bible as well. Others include apocryphal texts or excluded the book of Revelation. We tend to see these church councils as having made definitive decisions for the church. However, the conclusions from different councils were often revised by subsequent councils, and in many instances, they were seen as authoritative within various regions, not for the church universal. Fourth, the biggest development that I think that takes place during the canon during this place occurs with Jerome's translation of the Bible into Latin, the Vulgate. Jerome serves as a middle ground between Catholic and Protestant views on the canon. On the one hand, he definitely saw the 66 books that comprise the Protestant canon as authoritative. On the other hand, his patron, the bishop, requested that he include the additional books that the Septuagint contained. He handled this compromise by including a prologue to each book. For the books that were debated, he would say that these books are to be read by the church for edification and for other reasons, but they weren't at the same level as the other books of the Bible. Jerome's Vulgate would go on to serve as the Bible up to the Reformation, almost 1,000 years. So what happens during those 1,000 years, let's say from 500 AD up to 1500 AD? Before I go any farther, I need to take a little digression here. So what do I mean when I use the word apocrypha in this video? Like the development of the canon, this term has changed over time. It was used by Origen around 300 AD to distinguish between the texts that were read within the churches and the apocryphal ones. And by that, Origen was referring to texts that were hidden or had extended means that were of questionable value to the church, probably to the Gnostic Gospels or other texts. For Augustine, the use of the term apocrypha simply meant that the author of the text was hidden or not known. In fact, this is where the Greek word apocrypha comes from, is that it's hidden. For Jerome, the books that were not part of the Hebrew canon were called apocryphal. During the medieval period, it was often used to refer to a hidden quality of a text or a text that was not canonical. Today, the term apocrypha is generally used to refer to texts that the Protestant churches don't have in their Bibles, but are included in Catholic or Orthodox Bibles. So when we refer to the Apocrypha, what books are we talking about? Well, if we look at the table of contents for the Apocrypha here, we can see that it's referring to the books of Tobit, Judith, and then we have additions to the book of Esther, we have the Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, or the Wisdom of Jesus, Ben Syra. We have Baruch, a letter from Jeremiah, and then we have additions to the book of Daniel, the prayer of Azariah, the song of the three Jews, Susanna and Bell and the dragon. And then finally, we have the books of first and second Maccabees. 
On the Orthodox side, we have additional texts that they include within their canon, depending on which Orthodox church you attend. Oftentimes, this term carries sort of a negative term that shouldn't be there or something like that. I am not using it that way. I am merely using it to define the difference between texts that are included within the Catholic, the Protestant, or the Orthodox canons. That's all. So let's get back to our discussion of the medieval period. The first thing I want to say is that the medieval period was not a monolithic whole. It was a fairly diverse period. And second, it was not the Dark Ages. There was a lot of great learning that takes place during this time. So let's summarize what takes place during the medieval period in regards to the canon. First, the Bible was useful for teaching and edification. Its authority and reliability were not questioned during this period. Biblical authority rested on two primary ideas during this period. First, the New Testament books rested their authority on the idea that was authored by the apostles. As a whole, the entire Bible's authority was based on how it has been handed down through the Jewish and Christian traditions. It's been handed down through the church and it was seen as authoritative. Second point during the medieval period we need to realize is that the Vulgate was the accepted Bible for the church. The third thing that we need to realize is that there was less debate over which books were included in the Bible during this period, but the canon was still fluid. For example, around 600 AD, Gregory the Great viewed the Vulgate as authoritative. However, he thought that Tobias, the Book of Wisdom, and a 15th letter from the Apostle Paul should be included in the biblical canon. At the same time, the great theologian and scholar Isidore Seville accepted the 73 books of the Vulgate, but questioned if Hebrews, 2 Peter, James, and John's letters should be included within the New Testament. Around 700 AD, the great Orthodox theologian John Damascus argued that the apocryphal books within the Old Testament should be rejected. But at the same time, he felt that the letters from Clement, 1st and 2nd Clement, should be included within the New Testament. Fourth, Emperor Charlemagne united Western and Central Europe after the fall of the empire around 800 AD. A central pillar to his rule was deepening the piety and morality of his subjects. To accomplish this, he established programs to educate clergy and standardize the liturgy within the churches. A byproduct of his reforms was the production of some very, very high quality Bibles and portions of the Bible during this time. For example, the Lourish Gospels. Under Charlemagne's rule, Jerome's Vulgate was adopted, that is, all except for Revelation, which was kicked out again. Poor book, it's always getting picked on. Fifth, on the Jewish side, schools of scribes in Jerusalem, Tiberias, and Babylon, and other cities developed a reputation for the very, very high quality Bibles that they copied of the Hebrew scriptures between 700 and 1000 AD. These schools were part of the Masoretes movement and their copies of the Bible became the accepted version of the Hebrew Old Testament. And this is where we get what we call the Masoretic text from. Sixth, new questions and approaches begin to develop during this period in regard to the content of the Bible. For example, the Masoretes would put annotations in their copies of the Bible if they noticed differences between different copies of the text. You can see this in the Aleppo text here. And finally, with the spread of Islam across Asia Minor, clergy spread from Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, to Western Europe. This movement accelerated when Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Empire in 1453. These migrants brought with them their most precious early Greek manuscripts and other religious texts. This spurred an interest in studying the Greek manuscripts and comparing them with the Latin Vulgate that they were using within the churches. To help you understand this shift in how they looked at the canon, up until now, the question was, who wrote this book of the Bible? If they could attest it to an apostle, it was in. Now the question begins to shift to the microscopic level. What word was in the original here? How do we cross compare early manuscripts? This renewed interest in Greek and Hebrew is clearly seen in the work of Erasmus. 
who around 1500 starts comparing Greek manuscripts against the Latin Vulgate. And he was driven to recover the true text of the New Testament. He began collecting and cross comparing whatever Greek manuscripts he could get his hands on to produce a critical edition of the New Testament. Erasmus's Novum Testamenta Omne was the first Greek edition of the New Testament to be published. His work served as the basis of Martin Luther's translation into German and William Tyndale's translation into English, which would later become 90% of the King James Version. This brings us to the Reformation, let's say 1415 to around 1600. If you read any book on the history of the canon during the Reformation, all too often you'll see that the focus is on who said what, but we can't overlook what is perhaps the 800 pound gorilla in the room, the invention of the movable type printing press. When Johannes Gutenberg printed a copy of the Latin Vulgate in 1450, a paradigm shift occurred regarding the canon of the Bible. Bibles were no longer hand copied. This meant that they could be reproduced, more Bibles owned by more people being spread over more territory. It is this mass dissemination of the Bible via the printing press that raised two questions. Which version of the Bible should we be printing and which books should be included within it? It is into this context that Martin Luther steps. And we need to remember that Martin Luther was really a medieval scholar. He's a transitionary person. He studied and taught Greek at seminary and he cut his teeth on Erasmus's New Testament. He also accepted most of the Vulgate However, in regard to the New Testament, he followed Gregory the Great and questioned if James, Jude, Hebrews, and Revelation should be included or not. We can see that if we take a look at the contents of a German Bible, we can see that Hebrews, James, Jude, and then the Revelation of John are at the very end of their Bible. It's not that they were not canonical. They didn't reveal Christ to the same degree as other books in the New Testament in particular. Turning to the Old Testament books, Luther took the books that were included in Jerome's Vulgate, but were not in the Hebrew Masoretic text and placed them at the end of the Old Testament. According to Luther, these books are not to be considered equal to the holy books of scriptures, but are useful and good to read. So like he did with the New Testament, he moves them to the very end of the Old Testament. On the Catholic side, Cardinal Thomas Cachian was commissioned with examining Martin Luther's theology. What is of interest for us, though, is that Kachian basically agreed with Luther regarding the Old Testament apocryphal books, but he had a slightly different list of the New Testament books. He questioned James, Jude, and the second and third letters of John. Hebrews and Revelation were in for Kachian. As the Protestant and Catholic churches split, and with the rise of printed Bibles, both sides took definitive stances to define their biblical canon. Both Protestants and Catholics then used the canon as sort of an apologetic. Look, these guys include all these extra books, or how can they be a Christian church when they've left out these books? Points of view that still come down to us today. On the Protestant side, the Reformers agreed that the 27 books in the New Testament that were largely agreed upon since the 4th and 5th century should be included, even though Luther questioned the validity of four of them. And these are the 27 books that Catholic, Christian, and Orthodox churches today agree upon. In regard to the Old Testament, they looked at the prologues that Jerome included in the various books of the Old Testament. In regard to the apocryphal books, they argued that Jerome did not see these as holding the same level of authority as the rest of the books. And secondly, they argued that the church should follow the Masoretic text like the Jewish community did. A clear example of the Protestant position regarding the canonical text of the Bible can be seen in the 39 Articles of the Church of England from 1563. Regarding the Bible, it says, Holy Scripture containeth all things necessary to salvation, so that whatsoever is not read therein, nor may be proved thereby, is not to be required of any man, that it should be believed as an article of faith or thought requisite or necessary for salvation. In the name of the Holy Scripture, we do understand those canonical books of the Old and New Testament of whose authority was never in doubt in the church. 
the books commonly called Apocrypha, not being of divine inspiration, are no part of the canon of the scripture, and therefore are of no authority in the church of God, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of other than human writings. On the Catholic side, the Council of Trent is perhaps the most important moment. In 1546, this council declared that all of the debated books of the Old Testament were part of the canon. In response to the reformers translating the Bible into the vernacular languages, Jerome's Vulgate was affirmed as the only authoritative translation to be used within the church. And secondly, they followed the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, regarding which books should be included, not the Masoretic text. However, unlike the Septuagint and Jerome, the books of 1st and 2nd Esdras and the Prayer of Manasseh were not declared canonical. The Catholic Church's position on the canon can be seen in this quote from the Council of Trent. He is also to be an anathema who does not receive these entire books with all of their parts, as they have been accustomed to be read in the Catholic Church and are found in the ancient editions of the Latin Vulgate as sacred and canonical. So you can see how both sides of the aisle here take fairly strong positions regarding the canon. Remember last week when I was talking about the penumbra, that you have the shadow and then the fringes around the shadow. What takes place during the Reformation is that the penumbra disappears and we get a very black and white, very strong lines between what is in and what is out, depending on what church you belong to. While they both came to different conclusions, both sides applied similar questions to the canon. Does this text have apostolic authorship in regard to the New Testament in particular? Was it universally accepted within the early church? Which councils accepted these books into the canon? And finally, was it used in the liturgy and worship within the church? That's been a mouthful of information so far. So let me see if I can summarize the Reformation. First, to a large extent, the printing press brought a revolution in communication and knowledge. In regard to the biblical canon, it forced the church to define which books were in or out in a very definitive manner. Because once you print it and it's mass produced, now you have it on paper and you really can't go around changing your mind that easily. Second, up until this time, the core content of the Bible was not debated. There are seven to, let's say, 15 books that were debated in regards to the Old Testament, what are widely referred to as the Apocrypha. Hebrews and Revelation were the two New Testament books that were questioned the most often up until this time. And finally, lines are drawn into the sand as to which books are part of the canon. Since the Reformation, the biblical canon of different Christian traditions has not changed. And this is how they stand now. Protestant churches have the fewest number of books, 27 in the New Testament, 39 in the Old Testament, and the 39 in the Old Testament follows the Masoretic text or the Jewish community's scriptures. The Catholic Bible has 73 books in it. These are the same 27 in the New Testament, but they include additional books in the Old Testament, the Apocrypha. The Orthodox churches include the most books, 75 to 81 books, depending on which branch of the Orthodox Church you belong to, Greek, Ethiopian, Eastern, Georgian, etc. Anglican churches, as in most issues, take a compromise position. They follow the Protestant position in regarding to the 66 books of the Bible, but accept the Apocrypha for instruction in life, but not for the establishment of doctrine. As a result, if you attend an Anglican church, you may hear lessons being read from the Apocrypha in the same manner as they read from the Old Testament. Well, we've inherited a canon that is defined basically as it was during the Reformation, depending on which Christian tradition that you belong to. Instead of asking you questions about whether a book should be included or not, the Reformation brought a whole new set of questions. Prior to the Reformation, if a book was included in the canon, views about authorship that had been handed down through tradition were assumed. 
So for example, since the Gospel of Matthew was part of the New Testament canon, it was widely assumed that Matthew wrote the Gospel. After the Reformation, Matthew, for example, is no longer questioned as being part of the canon. I'm just using this as an example here. But the authorship of Matthew's Gospel is now questioned. Did Matthew write that Gospel? This is traditionally assumed, but there's nothing in Matthew's Gospel that says he wrote it. This also opens up questions about when was it written? In particular, was Matthew written before Rome sacked Jerusalem or after it? Was it written to Jewish believers that worshiped within synagogues within Israel prior to the fall of Jerusalem? Or was it written in what is modern day Lebanon, up around Antioch, to churches that were made primarily of Gentiles? The seeds of this shift were planted before the Reformation with Luther and others' interest in the Masoretic text and Erasmus's New Testament. The movement to get back to the original sources, ad fonts. What are the most accurate and original readings of the biblical texts? This shift in interest is evidenced to us even down to today, especially if you have a Bible that has notes within the margin. For example, here in John 7:53 through 8:1, the story of the woman caught in adultery, my Bible has a note here that says that this entire section is not contained in the earliest and best manuscripts and was almost certainly not an original part of the Gospel of John. Now, I don't have the time or the space in this video to go into a full discussion of the women caught in adultery, but it would make a great video. There are other scholars out there like Bart Ehrman or Elaine Pagels that feel that the Gnostic Gospels like the Gospel of Thomas should be perhaps considered part of the canon. But these are really outlier positions. Today, the canon is assumed. It is the microscopic examination of the various texts that is now in focus. So how should you look at the canon that your church or denomination holds? First, I hope you've seen through these two videos that the canon is not something that was decided in back rooms or was the result of power plays, even though a few of them tried. Rather, it reflects 2,000 years of deliberation on the part of the church, a process that has been questioned and debated from multiple angles. I think this historical testing should give you a great deal of confidence in the Bibles that you have. Second, what about the Bibles that those who follow a different Christian tradition have? For example, they may have less books in their Bible than yours, or they may have more books than you do. How should you view their Bibles? The first thing you need to realize is that the decisions that are included in their Bible were not arrived at arbitrarily, but they have really good reasons for holding to what they do. And they also reflect a very long and historical tradition that reflects the position that their church holds on both sides. If you attend a Protestant church, let me speak to you directly because your Bibles don't have the apocryphal text. But these texts often reflect literature within the Jewish community that was written between Malachi and Matthew. This is not some dark or silent period in the Jewish and Christian traditions. Rather, these books have found their place in the Christian tradition because they were important. Books like 1st and 2nd Maccabee help us to understand the historical development that takes place between Matthew and Malachi. Others help us to understand aspects of Paul's theology or stories within the Gospels. So I would highly recommend that you pick up a copy of the Apocrypha like this one and read it for yourself. Finally, I'm going to have a link down below. Crossway Publishers just posted a great article, Five Myths About How We Got the Bible. While they agree with most everything I've included in these videos, they also hit a couple of other points, and I'll include a link to that below this video. Until you get your copy of the Apocrypha in the mail, I'm going to close you with the word of peace. Oh. And don't forget to watch the first video in this series if you haven't already. It's just right over there.